Welcome, and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's conference. At that time, to ask a question, press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect now. I would now like to turn the call over to Dr. Henderson. Ma'am, you may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Jakiba Henderson, and I'm an obstetrician gynecologist and medical epidemiologist in the Division of Reproductive Health at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I lead the state-based perinatal quality collaborative activities in our division, and I'd like to welcome you to the first presentation in our second series of webinars we're sponsoring on perinatal quality collaboratives. Today's presentation is about neonatal abstinence syndrome and quality improvement projects undertaken by perinatal and neonatal quality improvement collaboratives to address this complex group of problems that occur in newborns exposed to addictive, illegal, or prescription drugs in utero. Our presenters today are Dr. Andrea Kuyanga, Ms. Madge Buse-Frank, and Dr. Michelle Walsh. At the end of all of the presentations, you will have the opportunity to ask questions and participate in the discussion. A recording of this webinar will be archived on our webpage at www.cdc.gov forward slash reproductive health forward slash maternal infant health forward slash PQC. Downloadable handouts are also available and may be accessed by clicking the handout tab at the upper right side of your screen and then selecting the files to download to your computer. Our first speaker is Dr. Andrea Crianga. Dr. Crianga is an obstetrician gynecologist and medical epidemiologist in the Maternal and Infant Health Branch, Division of Reproductive Health at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where she serves as the lead for the National Pregnancy Mortality Surveillance System and coordinator of perinatal substance abuse activities. Her research interests include maternal, excuse me, maternal mortality and severe morbidity, disparities in maternal health, and quality of obstetric care, both domestically and internationally. I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Andrea Crianga. Thank you, Kiba. Good afternoon, everyone. I was asked to provide some background um, on NAS, neonatal abstinence syndrome, and tell you a little bit about our work at the CDC on both NAS and maternal drug abuse more broadly. That's a slide. Okay. So use and abuse of drugs, alcohol, and tobacco contribute significantly to the health burden among women of reproductive age. The most common substances used by both pregnant and non-pregnant women are alcohol and tobacco. Data from the most recent national survey on drug use and health show that among pregnant women, 15.9% smoked cigarettes, 8.5% drank alcohol, and 5.9% used illicit drugs in the months prior to the survey. Rates of uh, recent illicit drug use and smoking were lower among pregnant compared to non-pregnant women across all age groups, except for those 15 to 17 years of age. In this particular age group, the rates of illicit drug use and smoking were higher among those who were pregnant compared to those who were not pregnant. The reported rates of illicit drug use most likely underestimate uh, the true rates because the percentage of pregnant women who report the recent use of illicit drugs on screening interviews can be substantially lower than uh, that determined by drug screening uh, using biological samples. The prevalence of illicit drug use among pregnant women does not appear to have changed significantly since the early 2000s. The 5.9% use prevalence estimate obtained from the 2011-2012 uh, National Survey on Drug Use and Health suggests that over 200,000 infants born each year were exposed to illicit drugs prenatally. The types of drugs that pregnant women are using has shifted in recent years. In line with the documented increase in non-medical use of prescription pain relievers in the U.S., a recent study found that prevalence of chronic medical use of prescription narcotics during pregnancy increased significantly in recent years. 
Is your exposure to illicit drugs, including street and prescription drugs used non-medically, as well as methadone prescribed as treatment for addiction, can have negative effects on the fetus and the neonate, and potentially later in life? Through maturity, fetal growth restriction, and neonatal abstinence syndrome, or NAS, are well-established immediate effects on neonates. NAS is a constellation of behavior and uh, physiological signs and symptoms in the newborn exposed to either legal or illegal addictive drugs. And depending on the exposure patterns, it may require significant pharmacological treatment. Science characteristics of neonatal withdrawal have been attributed to intrauterine exposure to a variety of drugs. Clinically important withdrawal most commonly results from exposure to opioids. And among uh, neonates exposed to opioids in utero, withdrawal signs will develop in uh, 55 to 94 percent of cases. Neonatal withdrawal signs have also been described in infants potentially um, exposed uh, prenatally to uh, benzodiazepines, um, barbiturates, and uh, alcohol. However, um, an abstinence syndrome after intrauterine intra exposure to uh, CNS stimulants such as cocaine and amphetamines has not been clearly defined. Clinical presentation of NAS varies with the opioid, the frontal drug history, including the timing of the most recent use uh, of drugs before delivery, maternal metabolism, net transfer of drugs across the placenta, placental, metabol placental metabolism, infant metabolism, and among many other factors. In, in addition, maternal use of other drugs and substances, including cigarettes, may influence the severity and duration of NAS. Onset of signs attributable to uh, neonatal withdrawal from heroin often begins within 24 hours of birth, while withdrawal from methadone um, usually begins around 24 to 72 hours uh, after birth. For these opioids, um, evidence of withdrawal may be delayed until five to seven days of age or even later, which is typically after the hospital discharge. The different time courses reflect variations in the half time of drug elimination and by and large, if one week or longer has elapsed between the last maternal opioid use and the delivery of the infant, the incidence of neonatal withdrawal is relatively low. So the opioid receptors are concentrated in um, the CNS and the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, tract. Uh, the predominant signs and symptoms of pure opioid withdrawal reflect CNS irritability and gastrointestinal tract dysfunction, as shown on this slide. Withdrawal for non-narcotic um, non drugs, um, the onset of, of signs um, has a wide range uh, between days and weeks. A discussion, of a discussion of diagnosis and treatment of NAS is um, obviously beyond the scope of this webinar, but just to provide uh, some background for the next two speakers, um, I'll say that um, I'll say that um, diagnosis is clinically based on um, the history of exposure, evidence of exposure following maternal drug screening, and infant biological testing and screening. Treatment depends on the drug involved, the infant's overall health, and whether the baby was born full term or uh, premature. Let's now look at the trend um, in NAS rates in the U.S. over the last decade. National data from the Healthcare Cost and Utilization Project showed that the number of infants with a NAS discharge diagnosis increased from um, a little over 5,000 to almost 2,000 cases between 2000 and 2011, corresponding to a significant increase in the rate of NAS expressed per 1,000 live births from 1.3 to 5.0 during the period. Corresponding trend in um, Tennessee resembles the national trend, with a rate of a NAS in 2010 over 6 per 1,000 live births. That's higher than the national rates for both 2010 and 2011. I've chosen to show the NAS rate in Tennessee because um, as of January 1, 2013, uh, NAS has been added to the reportable disease and events list in this state. Reporting hospitals and providers to meet electronic reports. The um, elements included are case information, such as birth hospital, reporting hospital, gender, date of birth, maternal county of residence, and the last four digits 
of maternal um, record numbers, diagnosis information, um, and also um, the source of maternal exposure. Weekly surveillance reports are released on the Tennessee Department of Health website, and shown here is the most recent brief report showing cumulative data on cases reported up to week 46 of the year. To bring all this information home to CDC and to public health, um, I will start by recognizing the need, um, the need to uh, prevent uh, poor outcomes related to maternal drug use. Um, poor outcomes are preventable. Um, if we counsel women to use contraception until abstinence is achieved, if universal screening for reproductive age women is implemented, if women are referred to treatment and management of both the primary abuse and also um, of the use of multiple substances and comorbid conditions. We should also note that treatment of substance abuse during treatment uh, during pregnancy decreases um, the risk of poor outcomes that can be associated with mass, and therefore a long-term monitoring of health um, effects among drug-exposed neonates is needed. And also there is need for tailored programs for affected mothers and infants, and uh, the next two speakers are going to provide examples of such programs. I'm going to end by telling you a little bit about our, uh, about our work uh, here at the CDC on, on this topic. Um, in September of 2012, we organized an expert meeting to discuss um, key expert clinical management and psychosocial issues among illicit drug abuse, uh, abusing pregnant and postpartum women. And as a result of the meeting, we have um, several uh, manuscripts in various stages of development. Uh, one such manuscript outlining the roles of obstetric providers in the care of women um, who are using opioids, um, pregnant and postpartum. Um, has already been published in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and it includes um, practical guidance and recommendations for obstetric providers, and I hope you'll find this very useful. In addition, we are involved in several research projects to better understand risk factor for NAS using linkages of vital records, hospital discharge, and prescription drug monitoring program data. Uh, we are also trying to assess comorbid conditions among drug abusing pregnant and postpartum women and we are in a planning stage for a study to compare and uh, validate screening tools for pregnant women. Thank you so much, Dr. Kriyanga. Our next speaker is Ms. Madge Buse Frank. Madge Buse Frank is the Director of Quality Improvement and Education at the Vermont Oxford Network, a nonprofit voluntary collaboration of healthcare professionals dedicated to improving the quality and safety of medical care for newborn infants and their families. Ms. Buse Frank has been actively engaged in neonatal care for over three decades and is an internationally recognized educator and consultant. She has collaborated on the design, development, and execution of innovative educational and clinical solutions for newborn intensive care units and health systems nationally, nationally and internationally. We'll now have our presentation by Ms. Madge Buse Frank. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Henderson, and I'm delighted to be joining this webinar today. Um, thank you for the information, uh, the, the opportunity to share. Uh, this important information. I have a couple of disclosures. Uh, I am leading the Vermont Oxford Network INICU Collaborative, which is an internet-based quality improvement collaborative. I also should uh, make you aware that all pharmacologic treatments for neonatal abstinence syndrome are currently used off-label, and I do not have any related financial conflicts of interest. It's also important for me to acknowledge many others who have been a part of this work. Uh, the speaker that follows me, Dr. Michelle Walsh, has been part of our expert faculty. We have uh, collaborated very closely with three state demonstration projects in Massachusetts, Michigan, and New Hampshire, and they've graciously agreed to allow me to share some of their data today. Um, I also want to acknowledge my colleagues here at Vaughn who have really been instrumental in conducting this work. Just a brief piece of background about the Vermont Oxford Network. We are a not-for-profit research and quality improvement network, 
and our mission is to improve the quality and safety of medical care for newborn infants and their families through a coordinated program of research and quality improvement. Um, we, our vision is to build a worldwide community of practice dedicated to providing every newborn infant and family with the best possible and ever improving medical care. Uh, we do maintain a very extensive NICU database uh, we have over 1.5 million infant records and over 50 million total patient days. And we currently are not collecting data on neonatal abstinence syndrome. So the data that I'm presenting today comes from audit data um, that was conducted as part of our quality improvement collaborative. Our network does include over 950 newborn intensive care units in 32 countries, and they're listed here for your interest. Um, 80% of all very low birth weight infants who are born in the United States do appear in our database. So I'm quite confident that uh, your states uh, are actively involved and engaged. In addition to the data work that we do, Vaughn sponsors quality improvement collaboratives because many of the problems we face are simply just too big to solve alone. And in these collaboratives, our centers come together to learn, to improve, to measure their project, and to share strategies and solutions and innovative approaches to care. And uh, we have had over 450 teams engaging in a variety of quality improvement efforts since 1995. For this particular effort aimed at neonatal abstinence syndrome, we really uh, gathered experts from the far corners of the U.S. and beyond, and this is our scientific steering committee and faculty who have worked uh, together to create the curriculum, to deliver the content for the Quality Improvement Collaborative, and to continue to provide ongoing mentoring via a very robust listserv discussion. So I definitely want to acknowledge uh, that team as well. In terms of who participated in the INICU, or internet-based NICU in 2013 focused on neonatal abstinence syndrome. We had 42 states and uh, four countries, Ireland, the UK, Canada, and of course the United States. The three states highlighted here are uh, demonstration projects. These are states who actually engaged in a statewide effort that you'll hear a bit more about. One of the reasons that we believe it's of critical importance to engage with States is that many of the infants who are exposed to substances are not in a newborn intensive care unit. And in fact, uh, based on our best estimates and some published data, 50% of infants with neonatal abstinence syndrome are cared for in community hospital settings that don't have a level three newborn intensive care unit. This made partnership, this this sort of situation made partnership not just with newborn intensive care units, but with states and state departments of health and third-party payers and others of critical importance. And so we partnered with Neil Quick, which is a quality improvement collaborative in Massachusetts, the Northern New England Perinatal Quality Improvement Network in Vermont and New Hampshire, and a Michigan-based quality improvement effort as well. All three of these uh, states have come together, they've engaged level one, two, and three centers, and have developed coordinated statewide quality improvement efforts aimed at neonatal abstinence syndrome. The structure of our curriculum includes both centers who are part of a statewide effort and many centers who are not. It is very much an intradisciplinary, team-based model of learning. And in this case, we had to define that intradisciplinary quite broadly, including community-based healthcare workers, uh, drug and alcohol treatment counselors, obstetricians, neonatologists, nurses, and really looking across the entire trajectory of care from the community to the hospital and aiming towards a safe and effective discharge back in the community. We developed a core curriculum and a more intensive curriculum, and the difference between those two is the core curriculum is focused more on the what, and the intensive curriculum is focused more on the how, the translation of the evidence into practice in a systematic way. Uh, 
our experts developed a toolkit for improvement, and we do have a measurement arm, which uh, includes serial Vonde quality audits that you'll hear a bit more about. We also produced a video, we actually, um, a virtual video visit to a center of excellence in British Columbia, and then we held a focus symposium on neonatal abstinence syndrome in Chicago. Um, we had over a, a thousand uh, attendees who attended our annual meeting in Quality Congress, and many of them were there in service of the neonatal abstinence syndrome mission. Our model of improvement is uh, one that's based upon potentially better practices, um, particularly given the state of evidence around the care of neonatal abstinence syndrome, this becomes a very important distinction. Uh, there is a paucity of evidence, and frankly, even when there is good evidence, until you translate that into practice, you won't know that it's truly better until you adapt it to your local context until you implement it and until you measure the results. So you'll hear me talking about PBPs uh, a bit as we, as we move through this presentation, and that is very critical to our model of improvement. We were absolutely pleased to have Stephen Patrick, who published the seminal paper in JAMA focused on neonatal abstinence syndrome as part of our scientific steering committee and active faculty, as well as Bob Schumacher from the University of Michigan. And they really consolidated the potentially better practices into three quite distinct categories. Uh, the first PBP is to develop and implement a standardized process. And that standardized process should include both the identification the evaluation, the treatment, and the discharge management of infants who are affected by NAS. Potentially better practice two focused a bit more on reporting and trying to understand and develop a standardized process for measuring and reporting rates of NAS and drug exposure. And potentially better practice number three was one focused on creating a culture of compassion, one of understanding, and a healing environment for the mother-infant dyad. Standardization is a, a key component to many of our improvement efforts, um, particularly when there is a paucity of good quality evidence, and I would say neonatal abstinence syndrome clearly falls in that category. We consider standardization to be the best that you know today, using the best available evidence that we have today, which we know that we can and should improve upon in the future. So I want to take a minute to talk about the evidence. In the realm of neonatal abstinence syndrome, it's probably no surprise to you that the evidence is weak at best. Most of the evidence is primarily descriptive. All of the drugs are used entirely off-label. And in, as it relates to the family, we have a very primitive understanding of the family, their values, and their preferences. Um, so that is our challenge. I tried to consolidate some of the lessons that were learned from the INICU 2013. Given the 200 plus centers that participated, often with interdisciplinary teams, and in some centers with as many as 30 and 40 and 50 people in the room who were interested in this issue, we have a vast amount of data from our evaluations. And uh, the evaluations really helped us understand what healthcare providers knew about NAS and what they don't. Um, we came to understand that this is a very complicated issue. Not only is there a paucity of good quality evidence, but we know even less about the pharmacology, less about the preferential treatment of one drug, methadone, versus morphine over the other. And so many of the lessons that our healthcare providers told us they learned in this collaborative were absolutely new information for them about addiction science, new information about how their attitudes may impact outcomes, new information about how the social determinants of health were impacting their populations. They learned a little about epidemiology and a little about economics, and I might add law and legal issues to that list as well. In the evaluations, the number one uh, aha moment for participants in the collaboratives was this idea of reframing addiction as a chronic treatable disease. That may not be new information to anyone here on the line, but it is of interest 
that many of our participants felt that this was new information to them and was really quite empowering in attacking this problem. So the idea that addiction is, is a disease and not a character flaw, the idea that it's a chronic disease and that like other chronic diseases, relapse is a common feature, the idea that addiction is a chronic treatable disease was completely new information to many people. And the idea that our attitudes about this disease impact our outcomes and impact not just mothers but their babies as well. Some of these lessons came through the virtual video visit where we had the distinct privilege of traveling to British Columbia. We went to Vancouver and highlighted a program led by Dr. Ronald Abrahams. Um, there's some published literature on this program and I'd be happy to share it with you. But we were able in the virtual video visit to highlight a, a highly integrated model of care from the community and really from the streets all the way to the hospital and back that addresses the social determinants of health. And this program is housed at British Columbia Women's Hospital. The unit is called First Square and First stands for families in recovery, and that's the inpatient center where they really can provide quite intensive addiction services to mothers who are in an acute stage of their addiction. Um, they also have a Chiway Community Care Center, and that's where much of the outpatient services are delivered to women and families, and that care continues intensely after delivery um, up until 18 months. And in some cases, we saw children much older than that who were still coming back to the Shiway Community Care Center um, with their mother in tow. Uh, the, this video is a five-chapter video. It really helped us to put a human face on addiction. And the women in the video really began to teach us how to best partner with them. Um, I'm going to take just a minute to play a brief uh, piece of a chapter from this video and with a little help from the technology folks I think this should play without problem you will need to turn speakers on your computer up in order to hear the audio for this video
All right. It looks like our video was interrupted, and so I'm going to truncate it there. For those of you who are interested in learning a bit more about the Shiway and for program, I'm happy to send you a video link after this uh, conference. Um, so as we um, move on to talk a little bit about the measurement arm of the collaborative, I want to share with you some of the lessons that we learned from the, the Von Days quality audit. Um, this audit was conducted um, in participating centers. We had over 180 centers who uh, elected to participate in the measurement arm. The audit was conducted in the, uh, at the end of January and February in the year 2013 and then repeated in the summer, so in a serial fashion. We will also continue to gather data through this audit in 2014, again, both in the early or first quarter and in the third quarter of 2014. Our purpose of the audit was really to understand the evaluation and management of infants who had received pharmacologic treatment for neonatal abstinence syndrome. And I'll pause there to say that we did not audit infants who were substance exposed, but their symptom severity had not required pharmacologic treatment. In order to get into the audit, you must have received pharmacologic treatment for neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, so that is one of the focuses of this audit. The goal was to identify local and, in some cases, statewide opportunities for improvement, and the states were provided with separate reports. We had a, the audit was conducted with both unit or center level measures as well as infant level measures. And at the infant level, we had 2,041 newborns from 42 states and three countries who were audited. Um, at the center level, of the 182 centers, 22% had no policy on screening. So there was a complete lack of standardization in 22% of the centers. 55% had no policy on the use of human milk for these infants. That, so that identified a rather large opportunity for improvement. We were interested to learn that one in five infants were outborn and actually were transported from their birth hospital to another center for care. And that 80% of all infants audited had not received any of their mother's milk in the 24 hours before discharge. In terms of what were the pharmacologic treatment regimens, again, these were all infants who required pharmacologic treatment, and 82% of them were treated with morphine, so that seemed to be the predominant agent being used. 16% were treated with methadone, but many of the infants were treated with more than one agent. 24% were treated with phenobarbital as an adjunct agent, and 10% were treated with clonidine. And of all infants who were audited, 35% of them went home on one or more medications. This becomes particularly clinically important in an age when there are many questions about the long-term impact of phenobarbital, in particular, on ongoing brain development. Um, some of the studies had an emphasis on soothing versus uh, sedating or medicating, so there was wide variations in practice among and between centers. We know that at the current time there are not good studies looking at non-pharmacologic treatment of neonatal abstinence syndrome. However, we do know at least antidotally that it's a low risk, low cost, and potentially highly effective strategy. Because many of these infants are polysubstance exposed and nicotine exposure is extremely high in these infants, particularly the non-pharmacologic strategies of soothing and calming um, have some potential to be quite effective. Forty-four percent of bond participating centers had no policy on non-pharmacologic options. Um, I'm going to, given the challenge that we had with the other video, I'm going to uh, avoid playing the, the swaddle and C-sway video, but there are a number of strategies, uh, clinically applied strategies for uh, non-pharmacologic therapy that we explored in a preliminary way in the collaborative. In terms of data, the Von Days Quality Audit, and this is Audit 2, 
asked a very specific question about infants discharged home on medications. And as I said, 36% uh, were discharged home on medications. Some babies we were surprised to find were actually sent home on oral morphine. In fact, 19% of them were. 26% went home on methadone. We had assumed that that would be a finding. A few went home on clonidine, 4%, and 52% went home on phenobarbital. 4% went home on DTO. Uh, so again, some infants went home on more than one medication. One of the questions that centers were asking themselves was that, was there a way to truncate the hospital stay and perhaps by sending babies home on medications, would they go home sooner? And there really has not been good data to justify that as a safe and effective practice, um, and we don't know what impact that practice would or would not have on length of stay. Bear with me with the slide, which is a little bit busy. The blue bars represent audit one, and you can see the black bar represents the interquartile range from the first quartile to the third quartile. And the red bars represent audit two. So when you look at the NICU length of stay, which might not be the entire hospital stay in many circumstances, you can see that the uh, median length of stay was 20. But the interquartile ranges are quite broad, from 10 all the way up to 30, 30 days. And the hospital length of stay was actually even higher. It was 24 uh, days, and again, with a fairly broad interquartile range. If we look at these during uh, the second audit, uh, and we, you can see that actually the NICU length of stay is a little shorter in the second audit. Uh, it was 15.5 days with a slightly narrower interquartile range but the hospital length of stay still remains quite long at 21, and again, with a broad intraquartile range. Um, when we looked at the, the infants that I've just spoken about in the first four bars are infants who went home without any medications at discharge. When you compare the discharge on medications, the actual hospital length of stay was not significant or statistically significant between no medications and medications, and um, that was clearly a new finding that we're looking forward to reporting in the literature. Our centers, in addition to the internet-based activities, came together, um, the intensive centers came together in Chicago. We had over 44 teams presenting posters. We're in the process of actually getting those posters uploaded and online in a systematic way but there were some very interesting findings. Many of the teams are working on standardization. They were able to, their goal is to decrease variation in practice, and many of them are working on scoring. Uh, there's a clinical scoring severity um, tool that's used. It's the, often the Finnegan tool, although there are a variety of tools out there that are used and they're looking to decrease their variation in the scoring, as well as variation in screening. Some of the units had identified high rates of inappropriate care, and they're looking at whether or not these babies are best cared for in a NICU or perhaps better cared for in a step-down or pediatric unit, looking at ways to avoid separation of the mother-infant dyad so that the mother can continue to provide consolation for her infant in a continuous way, and there are some centers that are looking at the potential of over-medication and trying to decrease those rates of inappropriate care. We have centers working on decreasing waste and cost. Uh, centers reported a lot of repeat testing where mother had urine screen, baby had a urine screen, baby had meconium, baby had cord. There were multiple tests testing in a situation where there was actually known and admitted substance use. And some centers are asking the question whether that repeated testing was actually contributing to the quality of care. Um, centers were working on increasing their ability to do what they know works, things like non-pharmacologic care and use of the mother as an intervention for her own infant as well as decreasing rates of preventable care-associated injury, um, focusing primarily on safe discharge practices and increasing access to care. 
Um, this is just a quick lesson from Columbus Regional Hospital. They had identified the four most important drivers of length of stay in their staff and are addressing those four issues. Many teams are working on standardization of the scoring tools uh, or, or examining the misapplication or misinterpretation of the scoring tool, which is often used as a diagnostic test rather than a severity scoring. The context of the scoring tool needs closer research and examination. It was never tested in preterm infants, so there's no literature upon which to base that practice. It was tested in a purely opiate exposed population at a time when the length of stay for neonatal absence syndrome that Dr. Finnegan reported was six days, and it's currently being applied to a, a polysubstance exposed population. I'll just uh, end with a couple of quick examples of, of uh, run charts from teams who have looked at uh, standardizing a variety of practices, including how and when and where they initiate treatment, um, at educational interventions like the Vaughn NAS initiative, and focusing on enhanced parent education, um, and uh, are making some progress. Our sessions are all recorded. Um, we do have enduring materials for them, and our goal is to share them as, as widely as, as possible with centers as well as to continue to engage with centers like Michigan and Mass and um, Ohio and others who are, are really interested in attacking this in a global way. New Hampshire was really able to engage the majority of their state um, and uh, obstetric hospitals in an initiative. They were able to collect data that showed a much higher rate of neonatal absence syndrome than that which has been reported in the literature or by the CDC or the Patrick paper. You can see here 12 per thousand live days. Uh, New Hampshire reported a 600 percent increase over the six-year period for which they looked at data. And they were able to look at this data by payer mix um, as well as by actual cost and charges. And these data may be useful to you in your state. In a small state like New Hampshire, their Medicaid charges were well over $2 million. And they were able to develop a strategy and actually get a governor's task force pulled together in August of 2013 with a very clear agenda of attack on uh, helping to support women in getting treatment and helping to support infants who require treatment. Massachusetts reported a very high incidence of neonatal abstinence syndrome as well. They reported 17.2 per thousand live births, and this data is courtesy of Dr. Piccarillo. They reported a tremendous variation in the length of stay among and between the 38 hospitals reporting here, and they reported a lot of variation in the management of these infants. Were they managed in a NICU or a regular nursery? Were they treated with a monitor? Uh, a lot of variations. So they have a next steps agenda for their work. And really, uh, this curve should look quite familiar to you. A similar parallel of the rates of NAS in Michigan was reported with a lot of variation among and between and by county. So I would like to end here by um, helping you understand that our need for collaboration grows stronger. In 2014, our collaborative will structure success in the care of infants and families and we would um, welcome the opportunity to expand this with states beyond those who, who have already enrolled. Um, I thank you for your time and for your attention. I have a lot of questions for you, and I'm looking forward to our question and answer period. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was an excellent presentation. We're going to uh, move ahead with, in the interest of time to our, our final speaker, who is Dr. Michelle Walsh. Um, Dr. Walsh is a professor of pediatrics at Case Western Reserve University and the inaugural holder of the William and Lois Briggs Endowed Chair in Neonatology and Chief of the Division of Neonatology at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital of the University Hospitals at Case Medical Center in Cleveland, Ohio. She is also the lead of the neonatal team of the Ohio Perinatal Quality Collaborative and is principal investigator of the NICHD Neonatal Research Network. Dr. Walsh's areas of interest include neonatal lung disease, clinical trials, and quality improvement. Without further ado, Dr. Michelle Walsh. Dr. 
Dr. Walsh? Oh, I beg your pardon. I had you on mute. <laughs> okay. Great. Hello, Dr. Henderson. Uh, I am going to elaborate a bit on the work that we have been doing in Ohio. Um, the first setting for what's going on in Ohio, we've seen a similar increase in the amount of narcotics prescribed and also uh, an epidemic of unintentional drug overdose paralleling those seen in every other state and across the nation. Um, these data uh, match has already referred to the increasing finding of both maternal opiate use and newborns that have been uh, found to be opiate exposed through maternal exposure. I will just um, say one caveat that these um, data, which are pulled from claims data, are potentially contaminated um, by not only narcotic exposure that derives um, during the pregnancy of the mother, but also that um, there's variation in how the code is used so that if a newborn, for instance, has a complicated surgery or some other medical illness and uses narcotics, um, you have to be very careful that the same code is not used and therefore the claim state is contaminated. We found evidence of that in Ohio um, and we're uh, working to try and resolve that. Um, we were, had the good fortune, um, we have six children's hospitals in the state of Ohio uh, and together we know that we care for the vast majority of uh, premature infants born in the state, over about 96%. Um, in our level threes, but we are uncertain what percent of the population of narcotic exposed infants we're capturing. To take a first uh, pass at this, we were funded to do a birth cohort study um, that covered 18 months, and we wanted to understand more about the mothers and newborns uh, who were diagnosed with narcotic abstinence syndrome examine what we anticipated would be a great deal of variation um, in the treatments used for narcotic abstinence treatment and from that select a potentially better protocol. As I said, there were six Ohio Children's Hospitals and affiliated sites, a, a total of 14 level two and level three NICUs. We only focused on uh, newborns who were greater than 34 weeks gestational age since the scoring for premature infants has not been standardized and only focused on those who were pharmacologically treated for their NAS. We collected descriptors, exposures, and short-term hospital-based outcomes. These are the children's hospitals who participated in this collaboration um, and you can see that we have a nice represent, representation geographically across the state. In the first 12 months of data collection, we collected 451 neonates. Uh, the average age of the mothers in this group was 26.7 years um, with a range across the entire childbearing spectrum. 93% were white, non-Hispanic women. 82% were single, and Medicaid was uh, the insurer for the largest percentage of this population. We asked where did the narcotic exposure come from? I should say this is all uh, from the medical records. This is retrospective. This includes mother's statement about exposures um, and also uh, testing that was done either on the mother or the newborn. Overall, you can see on the right panel that opiates were, um, including short-acting opiates, were the largest exposure. Uh, heroin um, was the next, and methadone in, in about equivalent numbers. Um, but there were many women, 250 in this sample, who had documentation um, of more than one opiate. The source, uh, when we could determine the source of these, 46% were from prescriptions um, and 34% were illicit and another 20% were um, unknown or not stated. So we have a lot of opportunity 
to intervene with more educated providers on the risks of prescribing narcotics during pregnancy. Uh, many of these were for acute injuries, musculoskeletal injuries, dental procedures um, initially, and then as the woman became addicted, they began to seek other sources. We do have opportunities. 88% of these women received um, some prenatal care. The pregnancies were extremely complicated with over 85% reporting one or more complications. The sexually transmitted disease rate, um, which this uh, variable specifically looks at gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, um, was fairly low, 7.7%. Um, Ohio is fortunate to have a low prevalence of HIV. We did not have a documented case of HIV in this cohort. But 31% um, were hepatitis C uh, positive. Hepatitis B did not parallel that. That was only seen in 1.4%. Um, since this, these women are relatively young, we believe that um, they were protected from hepatitis B infection by vaccination as children. If we look at the poly exposures, and as Mads highlighted, uh, the range of exposures, um, and on, on this slide I'm only focusing on illegal co-exposures, um, include near universal use of tobacco, marijuana, it was a frequent uh, factor seen. Cocaine um, was seen to a lesser extent, and amphetamines. Um, and alcohol um, was, again, by report, this was not directly tested, um, and was reported by few women. Our interpretation of this is that even among a group of women who are substance exposed, um, they know that you're not supposed to drink alcohol in pregnancy, and they underreport that. You'll recall we were concentrating only on term infants. Um, the average birth weight in this cohort was 2.97 kilos, gestational age of 38 weeks, and 52% were male. Uh, during the same time of this cohort, from vital statistics data in Ohio, the average birth weight of term infants was 3.3 kilos. So these are somewhat um, smaller than one would expect. As we focus in on the infant, the average time when symptoms started was 45 hours, um, although that did vary as we expected with shorter acting opiates um, presenting earlier and methadone, Sebutex, buprenorphine um, starting later with withdrawal. Um, although all infants had been identified before five days of age, even with those longer acting drugs. The average length of treatment across all of our sites was 18.5 days, and the hospital stay was 22.2 days. Um, there are an average of 1.5 drugs per infant. Interestingly, across these centers, um, there were about equivalent use of morphine or methadone as the first agent of choice. However, there were large differences um, by site. This slide, I show you um, the centers arranged alphabetically. Um, the blue bars uh, represent days of treatment, and the yellow bars um, represent length of stay. The vertical axis is the days. So across these centers, you could see the first three have very similar performance um, in their length of stay with an average treatment of about 18 days and length of stay around 20 days. But we have outlier centers. Center D, um, you can see that the treatment was longer than the hospital stay, and that is um, true. That's not a data error. This uh, one uh, center has an established, long established practice of discharging home on methadone to outpatient care. And the other two centers had dramatically longer lengths of stay. When we looked at the differences in length of stay um, by the drugs used in treatment, 
Um, you can see multiple centers um, over this eight, this data are from the first 12 months, but over the uh, 18 months of our total data collection, centers switched back and forth um, on their protocols as they were striving to get a handle on this. They weren't necessarily happy with their performance, um, and so would switch back and forth from one drug to the other. Um, there may be a hint that methadone in some centers uh, leads to a shorter length of stay, and that's something we intend to um, explore further in a research phase of the work. So when we compared in great detail the different protocols uh, that were in use across these hospitals, um, we have taken uh, the common elements from the best performing protocols at our two best performing sites to um, have scoring initiated in all narcotic exposed infants within 12 hours of birth, that all infants will receive non-pharmacologic interventions including swaddling comfort measures and a higher calorie formula. We will use mom's breast milk if uh, the mom is in an active treatment program and her addiction medicine specialist agrees um, that she has been compliant with care and is safe to breastfeed. So NAS scoring, we're all using the modified Finnegan. We have the first step in this process. We trained over 700 nurses um, caring for these infants to high reliability using the modifi modified Finnegan scoring tool and uh, the Diapolito training program. And in that uh, gold standard score um, works at each center. There's a video a DVD of the infant and uh, the nurse has to train until she can come up with the same score as the gold standard. We are not going to specify the opiate um, that we will ask each center to pick a primary drug, either morphine or methadone. We will use the same criteria for escalating treatment based on score. Once we have captured the infant um, where we've not had to escalate the dosing for over 48 hours, then we will begin to wean by 10% daily and discharge home 48 hours off drug. We are not recommending discharge on active drug um, unless you have a specialized program, integrated program to be able to follow both the mother and the baby. So we have um, now, um, since I submitted these slides, gotten our first um, data back as we have rolled out the potentially better protocol um, at um, two of the hospital sites, and in both centers, we've seen over a 50% reduction in their length of stay. This has um, substantial public health implications. If all centers in Ohio could reduce their length of stay to that of the best performer, there would be a reduction of 2,100 days of narcotic exposure annually in just these 14 hospitals, which represents about 14% of the treating sites in Ohio. And um, most importantly, a reduction in narcotic exposure, as we know that any drug exposure, any of the narcotic drug or phenobarbital exposure triggers neuronal apoptosis in these infants, so the neurons of their brain actually die. Um, and we're very concerned what the long-term consequences of that may be. Reduction in hospital length of stay obviously is going to have a direct translation into reduction of costs. And since in every analysis, 80 to 90 percent of these infants are being paid for by our public uh, payer systems, that has substantial implications uh, for reducing health care costs. So our next steps, um, we are working on getting funding um, for our Ohio Perinatal Quality Collaborative um, through a MedTap mechanism to spread um, this potentially better uh, protocol and protocol for both identification and treatment 
across all level one, level two, and level three maternity and neonatal sites in Ohio over an 18-month period using a breakthrough collaborative model from the IHI. Um, we feel we have a high likelihood of being successful as we have um, a robust protocol that has been piloted and shown to be effective. Um, and the previous relationships that we've developed in the other perinatal collaborative work, particularly around um, the reduction of non-indicated births prior to 39 weeks, we have relationships with all of these hospitals that we can build on. Um, and then we believe there's a lot more to learn um, about what actually might be um, the best treatment um, if you need to treat pharmacologically. Um, I completely agree um, with Ms. Buse Frank's um, findings on scoring. It, it is um, concerning to me that our lengths of stay have gone up so far and how much of what we're interpreting as NAS exposure in fact, our um, signs from other drugs that the infant's withdrawing from, including nicotine, and we're treating those withdrawal um, with a narcotic, and that perhaps we can do far better than this. Um, and I will stop there and thank you. I'd like to acknowledge our um, funding source, which was an innovation grant um, uh, spurred by Governor Kasich um, through the Ohio Office of Health Transformation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Walsh. At this time, I'd like to ask the operator to open the lines for questions. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session of today's conference. In order to ask a question, please press star one on your touch tone phone. One moment, please, for questions to come through. Our first question comes from Don Crumry. Go ahead, your line is open. Hi, I have a two-part question. Um, my name is Don. I'm from the Kansas Plan in Amer at Amerigroup, and I had um, a question about methadone treatment um, as far as alternatives to that um, in the NICU setting. In Kansas, um, particularly in Wichita, Kansas, they actually have some centers for infants that are not um, horribly severe to be able to withdraw in settings that are outside of the hospital. And I wanted to ask the physicians what they uh, felt of that, if, if the personnel were trained and able to um, accommodate that. And these would be settings where the mothers would be able to come to those settings. Um, I don't, I'm not sure uh, what your thoughts are on that. And then also, as far as hospital stays being prolonged and particularly in regard to methadone and abstinence scoring, one thing I have noticed is that you know it's always based on the physician's orders and how to treat how to treat when the abstinence scores are higher, and um, maybe there is some further research or outgoing information that you all could get out to the community in regard to that. And, and I'll uh, stop there. Thank you. Our next question comes from Michael Siegel. Go ahead, your line is open. Hi, um, I have a quick question. Has there been any data looking at um, the efficacy of doing some decrease in the amount of narcotic in uh, pregnant moms before they deliver and the impact on the withdrawal of the infants and even if there is safety in doing that? Um, uh, Dr. Henderson, are you going to direct the questions to us, or would you like us um, to? You can something? respond. If, if, if you have an answer, you can respond. Um, it doesn't have to go to either speaker, and all speakers can respond. So I think um, this is Dr. Walsh. I'm, not a neonat I'm a neonatologist, not an obstetrician. Um, perhaps Dr. Henderson is the best one to answer that question, but my understanding is that there is a great deal of concern in the obstetrical community uh, about the safety of weaning moms um, and that perhaps either precipitating intrauterine withdrawal in the baby or um, because the moms 
uh, withdrawal symptoms are not adequately managed, that they return to um, other illicit narcotics, which have a much lower safety profile and increased infectious risks for both the mother and baby. Um, there is work being done in a research format to um, see if there's a way that this could be done safely. Thank you. We ask, we ask on the obstetric side, Dr. Walsh agree with your response, and we'll just add to that that the, the data is actually pretty scant um, to support um, doing that, but um, your response hit, hit, was hit the nail on the head. And I would just refer the questioner to the mother study, um, and there are a variety of other studies, none of which have really shown a dose-dependent predictive value. In other words, the mother's dose of methadone did not seem to predict the infant's withdrawal or severity. Um, so that's, that's the other piece that I, I might add. Um, Michelle Walsh again. I, I would just um, like to also highlight one um, misinformation that we're finding is common in the community. Uh, both among our professional colleagues and among lay people, that women that are treated with um, buprenorphine, that their infants do not withdraw. And that is, is a wrong statement. Um, the mom study uh, showed that the withdrawal may be less severe, but they still had withdrawal. Um. Dr. Henderson, I don't know if you wanted to try to address Dawn's first question. Yes, I, 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 yeah, I was concerned, and I didn't want to cut in on the second question, but if, if you can, I would appreciate a response to her question. And I know she had some questions about alternatives to methadone treatment in, NIC, in the NICU setting, um, and there were some more that I didn't quite catch. So if you didn't get all of it, we can ask her to, to ask her question again. Um, John, if I understand your question correctly, you are asking about the safe um, care of infants with neonatal abstinence syndrome outside the hospital setting. And I'm not aware of any data um, or any programs, it, it, to my knowledge, that exist. So I would be interested to hear more about what's happening in Kansas. Um, certainly during the early observation and more acute stages of withdrawal where there's multiple titrations of medications, uh, that would seem to me to be a, a fairly risky, uh, potentially risky practice and one that is clearly not studied. And I'd love to hear what Michelle Walsh has to say in that regard. Um, Madge, I would agree with you completely. Uh, there, Bob Ward, um, who is a neonatal pharmacologist in Utah, has done some studies on how newborns process uh, methadone and has identified that they use different detoxification mechanisms than adults do. And it actually, in some infants, can result in metabolite products that may be associated with long QT syndromes. Um, and so that, while that's early data, that um, worries me a great deal that those infants could potentially be at risk for arrhythmias if they're in an outpatient setting. I think that there are multidisciplinary settings that are well set up um, to give couplet care for the mom and the baby together and keep them in a monitored setting. Um, so that it could be done safely. I'll just add to the um, prolonged QT uh, comment that, of course, we know that a certain number of infants that are classified as SIDS deaths may actually fall into a prolonged QT um, syndrome sort of scenario. So that is an important public health note. And there are certainly case reports of prolonged QT syndrome in infants exposed to SSRIs as well as mothers exposed to methadone. So this is just case report level data, but something to be conscious and aware of. There are no further questions at this time. Again, to ask a question, please press star one on your touch tone phone. 
One moment, please, for more questions to come through. In the meantime, while we're waiting for questions to come through, I'd like to remind participants that um, there are ha handouts available for the presentations today. If you go to the upper right um, portion of, your, of the page, there is an icon that looks like three white pages. If you click on that icon, um, you can select the handouts that you would like to download and to download the copies of handouts for today's presentation. We have one more question comes from Darlene Marcello. Go ahead. Your line is open. I work as a, um, I am an addictions counselor at a methadone clinic. And I currently work with a lot, I'm in Pasco County, Florida, and I work with a lot of pregnant women. What is the best advice that I can give some of these moms that they're coming in and they're kind of scared? They hear horror stories about, you know, the stigmatism with the nurses and, uh, they're, they're concerned about the welfare of their child and now they're on methadone. So they have, you know, some family members who don't quite understand that are saying, well, you're trading one drug from another. And I'm trying to say, no, you're gonna, this is the best, safest way to, to go without, um, going onto the street or, you know, going into withdrawal, therefore making the baby go into withdrawal. Do you have any suggestions for me? That's a great question. Um, and I think acknowledging that there are indeed stig stigma to this care is quite important. Um, we are working hard to try to educate doctors and nurses and others that, that maternal methadone treatment is, uh, either with methadone or suboxone, is the treatment of choice, um, that this is safe, effective, and benefits both mother and baby, um, but we haven't gotten to everyone yet. I think the number one piece of advice that you could give to the mother is to try to create a, a relationship with the nursing and medical team, to be as open and honest as possible, and to try to work within their lifestyle and their you know, other competing needs to be present in the nursery and learning and demonstrating their ability to care for this infant as much as possible. That will both help their infant through a very difficult and challenging time, and it will also help the care team understand their strengths and abilities as a mother. I would just add on to that, this is Michelle Walsh, uh, that in our collaborative we are recommending antenatal consultation with a member of the NAS team to introduce the mom to what to expect. Um, and I, we hope that by creating these in-hospital teams um, who are informed, that we can have more compassionate and understanding care within the framework of addiction as a chronic disease um, and modify um, with the truly um, negative uh, attitude that some caregivers have had um, to the moms. I can speak as well, uh, Michelle, to some of the Vaughn um, collaborative members who are really working on decreasing separation from mother and baby, who are working on educational materials, and who are really, on the other side, working hard to try to engage mothers. Um, so there are some innovative programs out there. There was a great demonstration project in Michigan where they actually were able to demonstrate a much more active presence of mothers at the bedside with a more welcoming atmosphere. So progress is on the way. I know it's slow in coming, um, but her staying in treatment is the first step. I think we have time for one more question. Our last question comes from Barbara Rose. Go ahead, your line is open. Hi, this is Barbara Rose. I'm the program director of the Ohio Perinatal Quality Collaborative. I actually have more of a comment than um, a question. I appreciate all three of the speakers' perspectives and um, want to commend uh, Michelle Walsh, who is the neonatology lead um, in OPQC, um, for her work on this, her pilot work on this, and her willingness to not only really um, uh, 
make this work in Ohio, learning best practices, but also the work she's doing in other collaboratives. And another word for those of you on the phone who may or may not have active working relationships with your state public health departments and state Medicaid departments. In Ohio, we've had a, a tremendous amount of success um, in a number of organizations and collaboratives working together on lots of different aspects of improving birth outcomes and infant health and um, clinical leadership, quality improvement, and public health all, all working together is really making a difference, certainly for the birth outcomes in our state. And I encourage all of you to um, build those partnerships as you're um, working together to, to make things better for babies and moms in your state. Thank you so much, Barb. I think we can take one more question, unless there is a response to her comment. Thank you, Barb. You're very kind. We do have one more question. It comes from Erin Hall. Go ahead. Your line is open. Thank you. Yes, um, I would love to get reactions uh, from all the presenters on uh, the use of the term neonatal narcotic addiction. Um, my understanding and in my work, we work um, pretty hard to help people understand the difference between dependence and addiction. And my understanding um, is that the neonates um, clearly can have dependence, but I find um, myself confused about the use of the word addiction when we're talking about um, a neonate. So I'd love to get comments from the group on that. I think your point is well taken. This is Michelle Walsh. Um, we, in working with our moms and our uh, care providers, like to use the term dependent for the reasons that you have raised, whereas an addiction would, implies more active drug-seeking behavior, um, which, of course, the newborn's not capable of. Mm -hmm. um, we do use the term addiction um, in some of our writing um, just to, I think, be uh, deliberately provocative in trying to gain people's attention and awareness of the enormous scope of this problem. Madge, do you want to comment? Um, I, I would agree with Michelle. I think that the word addiction is less precise than dependence, and the syndrome has been specifically named neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, without the A does not stand for addiction, and that I think that has been with great intent. Um, you'll often hear the word addiction in the lay media, and that tends to be quite an inflammatory word um, used in certain contexts. And so um, I, I think the terminology that the caller has suggested is is uh, accurate, and I would agree with you as well, Michelle. Thank you. One more comment um, from Dr. Krianga. Uh, I would agree with both um, presenters, and um, in the published literature, we do find dependence used more um, frequently than addiction, um, and also at the CDC, we are using uh, dependence as a, as a keyword for um, our publication. Okay, um, at this time, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Andrea Krianga, uh, Ms. Madge Buse frank and Dr. Michelle Walsh for giving us excellent presentations on neonatal abstinence syndrome. We would also like to thank you all for participating in this webinar and invite you to provide feedback about this presentation and the webinar series as a whole. We will be contacting you after this webinar for your input. We hope that our webpage and this webinar series will facilitate exchange of information and promote visibility of perinatal quality improvement activities throughout the country. And we encourage you to visit our webpage at www.cdc.gov forward slash reproductive health forward slash maternal infant health forward slash PQC to learn more about CDC support of perinatal quality improvement collaboratives. You may also contact us by email at drhinfo at cdc.gov. Thanks again, and have a wonderful afternoon. That concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may disconnect your line at this time.